I quite enjoy the GameCube era, and if you're watching this video, there's a pretty good chance that you do too. It's the definitive no-nonsense era of Nintendo, if by no-nonsense you mean discs that are too small to hold this measly image of the heavy from TF2, and a launch lineup that didn't even include Mario's Fun House of Enjoyment, but did have Luigi's Real Estate Nightmare. This was the horror of the 2000s for a Nintendo fan. I wasn't really around in the gaming space to hear much discourse around Luigi's Mansion at launch, but it isn't too hard to summarize. Mario 64 was an incredible game that's still talked about to this day, and people wanted more of that on Nintendo's new cube-shaped nightmare machine. So when instead of that, we got Luigi's Mansion, people were understandably underwhelmed. In the year of our lord 2023, however, where I'm wondering why it's a bit hard to enjoy a game I have 8,000 hours in, the idea of a little green man with a little green plan to save his brother from a spooky mansion sounds pretty appealing. Luigi's Mansion has already been discussed a lot on YouTube in countless different ways, so here I am now. A brown-haired white guy from middle-class America is gonna talk about it again. The premise of the game is simple enough. Luigi wins a mansion from a fake contest. When he shows up, he finds out his brother, Mario, has been trapped inside, and he teams up with old man Ingle Bingle to put some ghosts back into portraits and save Mario. It's a pretty fun little story, for at least what was probably cooked up by an intern at Nintendo who just wanted an excuse to put his least favorite character through some trauma. At a few random points throughout the game, you go through little story beats with Ungle Bungle on your little Game Boy machine, but otherwise the overarching story does a pretty good job of staying out out of the way without becoming irrelevant. Which is good because there's not a lot to say about the story. It's fine, it does what it needs to, but the best part of the game is easily the gameplay and everything and music and story. I, I, I was gonna list like everything. You, it's everything else. The story's fine. Everything else is awesome. The primary gameplay loop sets in pretty much immediately. After a pretty good tutorial on gameplay and a few story beats, you're thrown right into the mansion on your own. Your goals are almost always as follows. Find a room you can go into, clear it of ghosts and secrets, and move on. It's a pretty fun loop all things considered. Every room being dark so long as ghosts are in it does a good job of keeping you on edge, trying to make out as much as you can about your environment, and then handling the ghosts as they pop up. When they do, you need to get close to them, surprise them with your flashlight, and then press the absolutely delicious right trigger button of the GameCube controller to start sucking them up. I've always liked to do this thing too, where once you're finally sucking up a ghost, you rotate the stick a bunch and Luigi spins around and looks funny. It's, it's kind of silly, I like it. For a game that's so well known for its ambience, these little spats of high intensity are really fun. It's the classic survival horror mixture of spooky vibes transitioning into complete terror and action, just with a lot less focus on actively scaring the player, which I enjoy. The horror genre is absolutely ripe with incredible experiences for countless reasons, but them being so often intense to play can put me off from actively pursuing playing them. Meanwhile, Luigi's Mansion hits a lot of the highs that the horror genre has while being tame enough to just kinda sit back and enjoy it as a pure comfort game. Anywho, once you've sucked up all the ghosts in any given room, the lights come on, the mood brightens up, and you'll often have a chest appear, which contains either money or a key that plays the nicest little jingle every time you pick one up. It's an excellent way to wrap every individual section of gameplay up with a bow on top. Not too long or arduous, yet still satisfying to complete every time. After you complete your first few rooms, you're pitted against the real meat of the game. Portrait Ghosts. These are the ghosts that are completely unique, have a lot more health, and generally require you to solve some kind of a puzzle to start attacking properly. For example, the second ghost you encounter requires you to open this window to let her breeze in. She gets bothered by it while trying to do her hair, and there you go. These can range from really easy to really difficult to kind of confusing. Without looking it up, I still don't quite know what makes these two ghosts vulnerable. They just kind of float around and then after like like fi like 15 minutes they get they allow you to suck them up, I don't know. Anyway, these ghosts do an excellent job of keeping gameplay from getting too stale. Very few ghosts are too similar to any other, and they all have their own theming, stories, strategies, and so on. With each portrait ghost you capture, you're able to view their little bio in a menu. Seeing this grid fill up over time and reading the funny little stories about each ghost gives the game a ton of character and keeps you interested in finding more of them as you play. Some of them are optional too, only doing things like opening up shortcuts or whatever, and I like that a lot. Optional objectives do an excellent job of making the game feel a little more unique each playthrough and making it feel like you're choosing the way you're going. Even though this isn't often the case most of them are required, it's, it's a nice little touch.
So while the portrait ghosts are the main meat of the game, I'd say the mansion itself isn't just the metaphorical bun for said meat, but the restaurant that enables you to order food at all. This is the talking point you've already heard a million times in other videos talking about this game, but it's in the game's title for a good reason. The game's setting is an absolute joy to explore and see every nook and cranny of. For a GameCube game, it makes fantastic use of the resources it has, never looking that bad at all and making excellent use out of detail with things like lighting and my god so many fancy dust particles. I'm convinced showing off these particles is the whole reason a vacuum ever came into play at all with this game. From nearly the beginning of your adventure as well, you have access to a map by pressing with the Y button. Immediately, you're given the full breadth of how big this mansion is before you've explored even any of it. You can see which doors go where, which are unlocked, how many floors there are, it immediately makes you want to see it all. And as you go through the game, slowly seeing everything on the map get filled in is really fun. It's fun to notice that this hallway that you only get to a good way through the game is directly adjacent to these other rooms that you captured your first ever ghosts in. It makes the mansion feel like an actual mansion with a semi-believable layout. To continue gushing about the level design, I don't think people touch enough on how much the individual rooms of the game contribute to its charm and memorability. Despite not having played this game in more than half a decade till now, I still remembered each and every room inside this place. Of course, each room has unique enemies inside, often the portrait ghosts which add a lot of uniqueness based on the theming present. You have a musician in the music room, a baby in the nursery, and even an off-duty Discord mod in his lunch break room, it's all super memorable. It's done well enough to the point where these two rooms, the mirror room and the projection room, rooms with the same gimmick and the same exact enemies, are clearly distinct in my head still. I remembered which one comes first, what reward I got for completing which, and this is probably the worst example of repeating room types in the entire game. The variety is impressive, you have a ballroom, a safari room, an astral hall, you know, I'm sure things you remember from Grandma's house. And re real quick too, I want to talk about some rooms that I particularly love. The aforementioned music room is really charming, requiring you to slowly turn on each instrument around the room to form a complete song, it's fun. <laughs> There's the hidden room, which requires you to press X to go into first person, that, that's something you can do, and inspect this little mouse hole which sucks you through. No clue how any kid's supposed to figure that out, but I'm a fan of secrets that are just that, secret. And of course, the astral hall and its neighboring room, the observatory. The former is just a cool little room with some basic ghosts to fight, but the latter is probably my favorite room in the game. After looking through this telescope, the right portion of the room vanishes and reveals the moon alongside some falling meteors? You eventually put together two things, that you're supposed to shoot the moon with these meteors, and that, goddammit, for the first time in your life, you wish you could put some iron sights on a vacuum cleaner because this thing is really hard to hit. The moon explodes, naturally, and reveals a path made of light to collect an item. This whole thing just has that GameCube era jank where it doesn't really have to make any sense. Someone just had an idea and implemented it, and I, I like that a lot. So the mansion rocks, of course, but it'd be a shame to just have every room be as follows. Complete the objective and move on. Granted, this is the primary thing you're doing in each room, but there are certain collectibles and little quests you go on that have you returning somewhere you've already been. First and most straightforwardly is money. Money is everywhere in the mansion, literally everywhere. Any object, chest, chandelier, whatever it could be is filled with money or jewels. Collecting cash is the primary score that the game tallies over time. The better you do while fighting portrait ghosts and scouring the mansion, the more you'll get, with the game giving you a rank at the end. Sometimes it can be hidden in pretty clever spots, like these plants that need you to water them on the balcony, or this one plant that you need to water at three separate points throughout the game and rewards you with 20 million gold. So the game does an excellent job of rewarding players who pay attention to things like that and go back to explore areas they've already been with new abilities. New abilities that you often obtain by finding these element medals. Three different medals that, when attained, allow you to use one of three powers. Fire, water, and ice. After you get each of the medals, you can find each of the elemental ghosts in relevant locations. Something like a campfire gives you fire, water faucets or shower heads giving you water, and a fridge or bucket of ice gives you ice. These elements can either be used to solve puzzles or to fight ghosts, especially elemental ghosts which require you to use a certain element before fighting them. Fire beats ice, ice beats water, water beats fire. 
They're a pretty alright method of giving the player new mechanics to play with, though they aren't used for puzzles that often. Once in a while there's a door on fire for some reason or something, it's not too common, but it's a nice little addition. The final type of item you collect throughout the game are quote unquote Mario's items. Items that you find around the mansion in certain locations. On their own, they have no use to you, but when you bring them to this one portrait ghost, a unique one who's friendly and actually wants to help you, she can use her fortune telling abilities to give you status updates on the whereabouts of Mario and how he's doing. They're a fun little method of reminding you why you're in this mansion at all, and having a friendly portrait ghost to return to here and there is good. It's very nice to have a familiar face in the mansion that isn't just a toad. After you find all five of Mario's items, however, they recognize that they can't help you any further and actually want you to capture them to help you along your quest. It's not a tear-jerking moment or anything, but it's a nice little touching moment to see one of the few friendly faces you've met so far so willingly go down just to help you out. So those are all the items you find around the mansion, but the real reason you're finding yourself running around more than you'd expect are the boos. In this story, the boos are the real bad guys, who released all these portrait ghosts from the paintings that old man Dingle Bingle had. You're first introduced to them a little bit into the adventure, after solving a puzzle that seriously had me stumped as a kid. There's a button here in the wall that you can only see in the mirror. I, it, it took me legitimately hours to figure this out, I swear. Once the boos are released from this little trap, every primary room that you brighten up will have a boo hidden inside of it, which you can find using your boo radar. The radar beeps faster when you get closer to a boo is hidden, and once you inspect the object that they're in, it's a matter of keeping your vacuum focused on them till their health reaches zero. It seems straightforward, and oftentimes it is, but boos are unique in that they can change rooms. If they escape you and fly into any of the walls of a room, they'll move to whatever location was beyond that wall. It's a really interesting mechanic that tests your ability to remember what is where, but my god. Anybody who's played this game before knows the pain of having a boo fly into a wall that not only takes them into another room, but a whole different area. In this clip here, the boo flies to the room south of me. Technically speaking, it's only one room over, but for me to get there, I have to run halfway around the goddamn mansion to get there. Personally, I, I find that while this can be kinda frustrating, getting around the mansion is fast enough to where it really doesn't take too long to get where you need to go, so it isn't a huge deal. But it still does kinda suck. Especially when they fly into a room that you don't yet have access to. But even then, it gives me those janky GameCube vibes that I mentioned earlier. Maybe a perfectly polished, modernly refined game wouldn't ever have something like this happen. But the fact that it can happen is both pretty funny at times and just feels earnest for lack of a better term. These ghosts hate my ass, so the idea of them avoiding inconveniencing me for no particular reason would be a little bit funky, so whatever, it's fine. This only really happens that much with the later boos in the game as well, which have up to 300 health at times, Woo. but hey, it's the end of the game, that's how it goes. Next, because I'm kinda bad at transitions, I just wanna touch on some of the more prominent events throughout the game following a general order of progression, cause some stuff is a bit weird to organize in a video like this. The first boss of the game, a dead baby, is pretty straightforward, but does a good job of introducing you to the much higher scale of boss fights in the game. And beyond that, the whole first area of the game, that being everything before you beat the first boss, is really short compared to every other area, but I kinda like that. You've got just a straight line of rooms to complete, two very simple portrait ghosts, and it's boss time. In my playthrough for this video, I went from file creation to first boss in the span of barely over 20 minutes. The whole thing could easily be considered a tutorial, but because it's treated as its own whole area instead, it doesn't feel like one at all. Area 2 entirely rotates around this one big hallway here, with a lot more going on in it than Area 1. You fight a portrait ghost and free some booze soon after, enabling you to capture them both in the new rooms that you open up, and also back in the rooms that you've already cleared in Area 1. Just as that's finished, you'll probably notice a few things in the main Area 2 hallway. There's this weird floating candelabra, some music coming from a random room down the hall, and this godforsaken sound coming from this room here. I really like these little touches that pique your curiosity and make you look forward to finding the next key, seeing if it'll solve any of these random little mysteries. The boss of Area 2, Bogmire, is a weird one. I find his design to be cool as hell, being a really unique looking ghost among otherwise humanoid forms they often take. There isn't a whole lot to say about him, but he's got a pretty threatening presence during the fight, with these long shadows to indicate his location and discolored clones that chase you around. After the fight with Bogmire, you gain access to the courtyard in the rest of Area 3. 
The courtyard is a personal favorite area of mine, introducing you to a more subtle version of the game's main theme that appears in only a few other areas. Here you also find a well, with an almost ghostly scream of Mario coming from the bottom. It's got great ambience. Next, and this is a small one, but it, it it's kind of weird, I want to touch on it. Right after the courtyard you find this guy, Biff Atlas, which is an awesome name for a bodybuilder, oh my lord. He's your standard portrait ghost and you get some money for beating him. However, if after doing so you run on this treadmill, you get a key which opens up a shortcut in the mansion. Again, it's, it's a tiny little thing, but as far as I know there's nothing else like this in the game where you can just interact with a random object in this specific way to get an actual like, key, a big item in the game. It's, it's random, it doesn't show up anywhere else, but I like that. It's, it's goofy, it's GameCube, I love GameCube. I love you, Cube. I mean that. The boss of the third area is Bulossus, a giant boo that you encounter on the balcony, and it's probably the coolest fight in the game presentation-wise. The other two bosses have been a little bit underwhelming in that department, but this one absolutely delivers. Bulossus is absolutely huge, and the music and setting make him truly threatening. Of course, the actual fight is a bit mixed. Your general strategy is to lead him into these unicorn horns, popping him and turning one big boo into a ton of tiny ones that you can freeze solid and then suck up. Just repeat the process until there's none left. It's just that, when there's only a few boos left, it can be really hard to freeze them because of how well they steer clear of you. For this playthrough, it didn't take too long, but I know I've had times in the past where this fight took upwards of 20 minutes, most of that time spent taking down one boo every 5 minutes or so. But all that, all, all that jank is fine, because after this moment, oh god, it's the game's strongest moment easily. After getting the next area key, turning the ghost back into portraits, and returning to the balcony, you find the door that blocks your progression. But as soon as you unlock it with the key you got, this happens. Lightning strikes and the power goes out, meaning that every single room in the mansion is dark and filled with enemies, including the ones that you already cleared. And when I say filled, I mean it, and I like that a lot. I won't say this game is too easy, but it's far from super challenging. During this blackout segment though, Luigi's Mansion is at its absolute peak. The game is downright oppressive during this segment. Even the earlier rooms in the game have absolute clusters of ghosts, enough to where it's nearly impossible to suck one up without having two others pop up in the meantime. Moments like this only happen a little bit in the game otherwise, but I really can't stress how much fun this game is when things go to chaos. When you're trying to flank two ghosts and get them hooked, only to have another one spawn and force you to reposition yourself with a control stick, all the while trying to use the same stick to try to whittle down the health of the other two you're sucking up right now. I ran out of breath, but it's, it's cool, I love it. The blackout just turns practically every room into that exact scenario. In this one room, for example, you just need to walk from this door to the other, and they're right next to each other. And in those few steps you take, three enemies spawn. I feel like I'm repeating myself, but this segment absolutely fucks. On top of everything else, some rooms have added rare ghosts for you to find that drop a ton of money, giving incentive to throw caution to the wind and explore the mansion during this incredibly tense segment, where every room is so deadly. Anyway, the way you actually progress through the blackout is by proceeding through the door you unlock that triggers it. Down the hallway on the right, there's a telephone room. You know, like the room Grandma used to have with the three telephones lined up on isolated tables. In this room you get three calls. One from Toad who's crying for help, another from old man Uncle Frunkle trying to tell you about a ghost who likes rooms with mirrors, and a third from the entire fucking internet telling you about a theory that Luigi is dead throughout the whole game because the shadow kinda looks like he committed suicide. Anyway, the ghost that Stingle Dingle tells you about that likes mirrors, he's hard to find. The fact that he likes mirrors is the only hint you get to find him, and there's a lot of rooms with mirrors. But specifically, he means this one. Not any of the others, not the room with a giant mirror in it, then ah, this one. I think Nintendo just couldn't think of a better way to tell you how to go to this specific room without saying it outright or something. Anyway, in that room, you fight a spooky guy, get a key to a room that was unlocked before the blackout, and go there to turn on the breaker and restore power to the mansion. The blackout isn't too difficult of a section if you go to exactly where you need to as fast as you can, but it's such a stupidly cool way to change the pace of the game. 
Like I said, Luigi's Mansion generally doesn't go crazy hard on the difficulty or scares, but this segment does so much to prove that it can if it wants. Even as a 20-something nowadays, I got genuinely tense playing through this segment for this video. Anyway, after the blackout, Area 4 takes you primarily to the highest and lowest floors of the mansion, and there are two segments of note. First, these guys. Most portrait ghosts aren't too hard to deal with, with a few minor exceptions. The ice guy can be a bit scary and the discord moderator shoots fireballs, but pretty much none come close to the toy soldiers. After turning on all of these little clocks, all three of them activate at the same time, and they all have 100 health each. And while you're attacking any given soldier, any of the other ones still left on the ground can attack you freely and they have a damn potent attack with their toy guns. It really isn't like awful, but if you get unlucky with these guys, you can easily see your first game over here. It's a nice little change of pace if nothing else. Anyway, second of note in the fourth and final area of the game is the rooftop. Or more so, somewhere you get access to from the roof. On this left chimney thing, you just get a key from a chest after defeating some basic ghosts. On this right chimney, however, there's a hole. If you fall into said hole, you end up landing here, the sealed room. At first, it isn't obvious where you are since, as the name implies, the room is completely sealed off from the rest of the mansion. But if you open up the map and connect the dots, you realize you're on the other side of this blockaded door from Area 3. It's not a massive moment or anything, but it's just a great example of the countless things this game does to make you say, oh, I get it. It's a feeling humans have chased for the past couple hundred million years. We went from prehistory, to the Egyptians, to the Romans, to Luigi's Mansion, just as God intended. The final act of Area 4 is when you finally confront the true terror of the mansion, the French. It's after this fight that you're also able to capture the last of the booze in the mansion, with all major rooms now being lit up. In my recent playthrough, I wanted to do so before getting the key to the final area, but after I caught the boo, the key was gone. So I ran around a little bit, came back, and got two keys. I love the GameCube, nothing else to add. Actually, I, no, no, there is something to add. That wasn't the final boo. I haven't ever had this issue before while playing through this game, but in this playthrough it finally happened. I had 49 boos captured and the last one was somewhere in the mansion, and I had no idea where meaning I had to scour the entire thing in search of him. And turns out he was hiding in one of the first rooms of the game, fancy that. Normally I think you could easily see this as a really frustrating problem with the game or something really annoying that can happen, but being the end of the game it was kind of nice to run through the entire thing again and see all the rooms I'd been through. A nice little refresher before the last thing in the game, the final boss, has... no, no duh. After getting enough booze, you're able to enter the coolest room of the game, the money room. I don't know what this, it has a name, I forget the name of it for the script. It's a fancy room. This chandelier has some money in it. That's mean, but also kind of fun. Thanks GameCube. Anyway, King Boo has been hiding in here all along and has Mario trapped in a painting. He says something about sleeping and schlooping and then Bowser schlorps you up into a painting as well. I don't think that was a good joke, but I'm sticking with my guns. Inside the painting, finally, we're on the roof and it's on fire and Bowser's here. I don't know why Bowser is in this game, but I also don't know why Old Man Sprinkle Finkle sounds like this. So whatever, I don't care, Bowser time. The fight isn't too complex, with Bowser having about 4 attacks. Breathing fire, trying to suck you up, speed walking around, and throwing some spiky balls at you. The last attack is the one you need. You can attach them to your vacuum by sucking them up and then shoot them at Bowser's head to knock it off. Literally his head comes off, that's... damn. King Boo comes flying out of his head, and then you do your thing while Bowser shoots some projectiles at you. Pretty much just rinse and repeat till he's finished. It's not too bad of a fight, and it's easily the most difficult boss in the game, particularly with that fast walking attack with his head is on backwards. At the end, you finally capture King Boo and take his crown, which is the jewel equivalent of some fake Jordans. I like Luigi's Mansion, it's pretty hard not to. I've always had an affinity for shorter games that you can run through in a day at any time, and this game fits that bill almost perfectly. 
I recorded my entire playthrough, and I have just under 4 hours and 10 minutes of gameplay total, but despite its short length, it didn't feel like it was cut short or didn't offer enough. I didn't speed through the game at all, I captured all the booze, got nearly 100 million gold for the A rank, captured every portrait ghost, and so on. I spent all 4 hours just doing stuff on the game, having a good time. I enjoy the game not only for its modest length, but also how easy it is to pick up and play through at any time. Like I said earlier, not too much of the game is super difficult or scary or anything. It hits that nearly perfect balance between being difficult enough to make you have to try, but not being so difficult as to require me to retry an area several times or tense up in my seat as I play constantly. I can just boot it up, sit back on the couch, and kill an afternoon, it's great. And of course sections like the blackout and other difficult rooms interspersed throughout keep it from being just a pure casual game. It has excellent little moments of chaos where two ghosts appear as you're sucking up another or you're desperately trying to get some cash while being chased around, or again, the entirety of the blackout, what an incredible section, this game rocks! I was gonna say the perfect descriptor for this game is a nice little game, but I'm gonna change that to a great little game. The sound it makes when you suck up ghosts? Great. The fact that the giant green button on the controller does nothing but call for Mario? Mario. Great. The weird thing that happens when you inspect the mirror in first person? Great. Great little game. You should play it if you have it. I might make more videos like this if people like it. It was very fun to make. I don't know if I have anything significant to say in this video. I don't know if any of it's too new, but hey, I love this game. I want to share it. I'll talk uh, if you like it. I'll talk about more games that you probably know about. I'm sure a lot of you will like the games that I have playing for kind of making videos like this about. Anyway, goodbye.